we're very pleased that you're here here with us this evening. I should introduce myself before I start. Um, I am Matthew Smith. I am the director for the Center for the Study of the Legacies of British Slavery, or actually Legacies of British Slavery. I'm very pleased to be here with you this evening and um, to be welcoming our special guest, uh, Professor Jennifer Morgan, who you'll hear about uh, very shortly. Before I begin, I want to assure you that we will have a very rich and rewarding evening of intellectual exchange this, this evening with no interruptions, uh, including fires. But in the event that I am wrong in that, in that um, assumption, there are two exits, entrances and exits, which you came through to uh, enter the room this evening. You can go through there. There are ushers on the outside who will safely lead you uh, to exits to the building, but that shouldn't happen. So we can just focus on why we're here, which is to hear uh, the work of Professor Morgan. It is also a special pleasure to welcome you to this uh, lecture because it's the first one that we're having in this series, which we have called the Elsa Gavaya Speaker Series. And this is something that we are hosting through the center as, and also by extension through the Department of History at UCL. And for those of you who are less familiar with our center, I'm going to just say a brief word or two on it. Our center grew out of a landmark project, the Legacies of British Slave Ownership, that started about a dozen years ago and has been globally recognized as a major public history project. That project, with funding from the AHRC, the ESRC, and further support from the Hutchins Center at Harvard University, traced the links between British capital and transatlantic slavery producing a remarkable database of well over 60,000 names, principally of slave owners, um, but not only, and has received over a million visitors to the database. We're moving into a new phase of our work now that will consider closely the experiences of enslaved people in the British colonies in the last decades of slavery. This work, which we have titled Valuable Lives, will produce a series of new project and research opportunities and indeed collaborations. And I invite those of you wishing to learn more about the LBS, the database, the center, and the new project, to please visit our center with the, uh, the website and the URL uh, is there on the screen. This evening's lecture is a new venture for us. This is the first of what we hope will be an annual event in which we highlight the work of a scholar or scholars whose contributions to how we think, approach, read, and reflect on the contours of Atlantic slavery and its powerful afterlives have brought refreshing and original insights to historical scholarship. And I am so delighted that Professor Jennifer Morgan, whose work exemplifies all that and more, has agreed to be our inaugural speaker. I also thank our colleague Hannah Murphy at KCL, where Professor Morgan will be speaking on Monday at another event for facilitating the visit to London. When I became director of the center in 2020, it was my intention that we start an annual lecture for the very reason we're gathered here, to have this level of public engagement with an esteemed historian in the field. In considering the name of the lecture, it seemed quite obvious that we should use this event as an opportunity to publicly honor the incredible legacy of the work of Professor Elsa V. Govayo. And there's several reasons why we've decided to name the series after Professor Govayo. Elsa Govayo, a Guyanese historian who spent her career in Jamaica, is considered a giant in the study of British slavery and its legacies. Her contributions are profound and have been recognized most visibly in uh, the Caribbean, especially by our colleagues in the Caribbean. There's an Elsa Govaya lecture at the University of the West Indies Mona campus that has been in existence since the mid 1980s. There's also an Elsa Govaya lecture at the Cave Hill campus at the University of the West Indies. There's an Elsa Govaya book prize for the Association of Caribbean Historian, Historians. And there's also, uh, there are also a wing of the special collections of the University of the West Indies main library named after Elsa Govaya. So in naming the lecture after Elsa Govaya, we're not following others or repeating, but we're actually expanding the recognition of her pioneering scholarship. That scholarship is especially significant to us at the Center for the Study of the Legacies of British Slavery, concerned as we are with the legacies 
of that long and cruel history of slavery in the uh, British Caribbean and across the Atlantic. At a time when the study of British slavery and close appraisal of its consequences on various sides of the Atlantic was in its infancy, infancy Gavaya joined a generation of Caribbean historians who sought to move beyond narratives of racial slavery to investigate how they actually functioned and what sorts of traces they left on the contemporary. She looked most closely at the society. Her argument was that to fully appreciate the breadth of the entire enterprise of slavery, you must look at the interlocking parts that moved the gears and created out of it new societies. The planters, the free people, the traders, the financiers, and especially the enslaved are all part of a society that could not be seen as amorphous, but rather deeply interconnected. The study of slavery and by extension Caribbean history, she argued all the way back in 1956, requires that the historian quote, seek a wider understanding of thoughts, habits, and institutions of the whole society, end quote. This engagement with the whole society in the sources and in her methodology led Govaya to make some of the most impactful findings of the field. She anticipated the work of Edward Brathwaite when she insisted on intersocial exchanges that would later become known as creolization. Yet even more significantly for us at the center is that Govaya's first steps in this direction were taken right here in the history department at UCL. She arrived in London with a wave of Caribbean student migra migrants in the years just before Windrush to take up a national scholarship from Guyana. She studied British history in the department and by all indications excelled. Thanks to incredible research done by one of our students in the department, Ms. Naya Okeke, who's actually uh, one of our ushers outside, we know that Gavaya earned a first in all her courses in the department, coming in the top three for every year of her undergraduate life. She won the Pollard Prize for Best Essay in English History in 1947 and graduated with a first class honors degree. She immediately enrolled into the MA program in our department. And some months after starting, the program tutor wrote a strong letter to the faculty administration. He said that having read Ms. Gavaya's written work, he was of the view that she should be retroactively enrolled into the PhD program because the quality was of such a high standard. She was the first woman to earn the British Guyana Scholarship. She, she may have been the first Caribbean woman to earn a first class honors degree in history at this university and eventually a PhD. She would have come into a class where black women were extremely few in number on the campus. A reality, sadly, that's very true today. The, these were from all indications, good years for her. Gavaya made a lot of lasting friendships here as she did her work. Just three years after Eric Williams published Capitalism and Slavery, Elsa Gavaya submitted her PhD thesis titled Slave Society in the Leeward Islands, 1780 to 1800. She had decidedly moved on again at a time when the study of British slavery, let alone the society of enslaved people, the study of the society of enslaved people was so woefully underdeveloped, emerging most often as footnotes to larger studies of empire. She sought to boldly correct that. In her last year of the PhD, she applied for a job at the newly formed Department of History at the University College West Indies in Jamaica. And it was there she created her legend as teacher, researcher, and writer. She was very famous for her classes as many of her uh, students attest. And there's a wonderful video tribute to Elsa Gavaya's years at UWI that the University of West Indies Mona History Department has produced, which I invite you to take a look at. When she was an 18 year old sitting in her home in Georgetown, Guyana and filling out her application to come to UCL history department with a mix of excitement and trepidation for the future and changes that awaited her in London, Elsa Gavaya thought long and hard about one key section of the application. She was asked to indicate any interests and achievements she was especially proud of. At 18, she chose to highlight that she had spent the past few years as a girl guide and was in fact now trained as a brownie. Very telling this, that that was the achievement she sought to highlight on her application form. One expects that in the final years of her life before she unexpectedly passed in 1980, that she would look back at her phenomenal achievements and have the same sense of excitement for her work 
that she did at the start of her journey. On behalf of the center at UCL, I am proud this evening to launch the speaker series in the name of one of our department's greatest graduates, Professor Elsa Vesta Govaya. And I now invite my colleague and chair of the center, Professor Catherine Hall, to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Morgan. Thank you. Well, that was wonderful to hear uh, so much about Elsa Govaya, who I've been reading for years, but I certainly did not know all those details. So thank you uh, to Matt and for the, is it Naomi who did some of the work in the UCL archives? Anyway, great. Well, it's my uh, delight to have the honor of introducing Professor Jennifer Morgan this evening to deliver our first annual Elsa Gavaya lecture. Professor of History at, at NYU, she holds a number of important positions in professional bodies. Is it all right? Oh yeah, okay. And is a lifelong member of the Association of Black Women Historians. I've been reading Jennifer's work for years. My copies of her books are much thumbed, marked, unfortunately, even the odd coffee stain as I pour over them and bear witness to how vital her work is to me and to so many others for an understanding of the significance of the intersections of gender and race in the Black Atlantic, about the major contribution she has made to feminist and anti-racist scholarship and focus on her two books. There's no time to reflect on her articles, particularly the wonderful Partus Sequitur Ventrem, Law, Race and Reproduction in Colonial Slavery, which was in small acts in 2018. So her first book, Laboring Women, Reproduction and Gender in New World Slavery, published in 2004, made us understand the centrality of enslaved women's reproductive capacity to the success of the plantation system and the accumulation of capital. The crucial matter of hereditary and the permanent mark of racial inferiority meant that enslaved women's reproductive identity was at the heart of the system of slavery in ways that needed unraveling, which is what she did. Making race, calling blackness into being, that's one of her phrases that I particularly like, in early colonial America, took place across a range of sites, in legislation, in wills, in indentures, in travel writing and journals. She drew on this range of sources um, in Barbados and the American South, to grasp the degree to which women were carving out the wealth that supported the English empire through their labor in the fields and their work of social and biological reproduction. Completed women's reproductive potential with greed and opportunism, she writes, they utilized both outrageous images and callously indifferent strategies to ultimately inscribe enslaved women as racially and culturally different while creating an economic and moral environment in which the appropriation of a woman's children as well as her childbearing potential became rational and indeed natural. About blackness and whiteness, for we're heavily dependent on the archives of slave owners which demand critical reading. She cited the great Toni Morrison, the fabrication of an Africanist persona, as Morrison wrote, is reflexive, an extraordinary mediation on the white self, a powerful exploration of the fears and desires that reside in the writerly conscience. It's a, an astonishing revelation of longing, of terror, of perplexity, of shame, of magnanimity. That is the way to read colonial archives. <coughs> Reckoning with slavery, gender, kinship and capitalism in the early Black Atlantic came out long awaited in 2021. Jennifer Morgan's explicit about both the, indisciplinary, the interdisciplinary, not indisciplinary, interdisciplinary nature of her work 
making use of demographic and archival skills, economic and literary modes of analysis, and about the debt she owes to black feminist scholarship and critical race theory. She was building on Hortense Spiller's brilliant insight as to the captive body as the site of a metaphor for value, drawing on Lisa Lowe's former foregrounding of intimacy, Sadia Hartman's insistence on the need to derange the archive, Marisa Fuentes on the ways in which violence transferred from enslaved bodies to the documents that count them. She has developed an archival practice that reads silences creatively and is reparative. At the heart of the book is the recognition that for women, to quote, to be enslaved meant to be locked into a productive re uh, relationship whereby all that your body could do was harnessed to the capital accumulation of another. This required uh, economic and racial thinking, she demonstrates, were mutually constituted. So there's a, um, a lot of analysis of the development of economics in this period in relation to the slave trade in particular. The ledgers of the slave trade located Africans in bills of sale, not as members of households and families. And this required a social transformation involving spectacular violence and everyday cruelties. Rational and black women as entry marks on, leg on ledgers became entwined in these early years and transformed these women from subjects to objects of trade through concepts of population, value, market, currency, and worth the insinuation of economic rationality into colonial intimacies is the crux of the matter. Europeans ascribed stable value to black bodies as commodities, and they claimed that the province of assessing value belonged only to those who came to see themselves primarily as white. that the space of corporeal contradiction, the enslavability of women, which included their reproductive capacity and made them understood as fundamentally different from the households in which they labored, even as their sexual vulnerability was open to white men. This was the space of corporeal contradiction, which was crucial to perception, the perception of Africans as legitimate commodities. This is the work, she argues, that the race reproduction bind has performed in putting racial slavery into the heart of early modern capitalism. Her book is a counter history on the origins of racial slavery. So it's with real pleasure that I invite you to welcome Professor Morgan as she delivers her lecture on the measure of their sadness, slavery and private life in the early Black Atlantic. Welcome to UCL. Thank you. Thank you all for being here and on a beautiful, a uh, sunny afternoon. I'm, I'm incredibly honored uh, that you chose this. Um, I'm also really honored by the invitation. Um, thank you to Professor Matt Smith and to Catherine Hall. Um, it's an extraordinary thing to be asked to uh, deliver an inaugural public lecture um, uh, that honors uh, Professor Elsa Gavaya. As I spent some time reading and thinking about Gavaya, the thing that struck me again and again is how recently she was a first, right? Um, how little time has passed uh, between then and now. 
um, and also the depth of her bravery. Uh, faced with a new research project, I am so bolstered by my capacity to stand on the shoulders of my um, of uh, those whose work undergirds my own. Um, I've recently tried in a couple of venues to elaborate the theoretical foundations of my archival scholarship, something that I'll do again today. Um, and the gesture reminds me of how deeply grateful I am to the work of pioneers like uh, Elsa Gavaya, who've made our own study of slavery in the Atlantic world possible. To have written as she did almost into a void um, and to do so from such a location of scholarly isolation, well, it really boggles my mind to consider it. And it's um, incredibly brave. I don't think I could be so brave. So my talk today engages two broad themes that have emerged for me out of the project of writing my book. Um, one concerns the nature of 17th century archives for African and Afro diasporic women. And the second concerns questions about the way in which the notion of the private coheres around the exclusion of those women um, from that very category. So the former question is one of historiography and the latter is a question of knowledge formation. Um, both both speak to a larger project that is a philosophy of history, a claim about what engenders change over time in the space of the modern and what matter of uh, methodological stance we need in order to uh, um, apprehend it. And I think you will see, as I ask you to bear with me as I think through a very new project, um, that the latter question is far more provisional for me um, at this stage. But on both points, I just remembered that I have, there we go. <laughs> But on both points, I am deeply influenced by the work that my colleagues here um, at the Legacies of British Slavery Project have undertaken to center the 18th and 19th century histories of slavery and slave ownership back into British life, both historically and contemporaneously. My own work and interest continues to be located at the start of the early modern in the late 16th and early 17th century as the shift to new world colonialism and extractive economies takes hold. But what links my focus with the present is, as my esteemed colleague Catherine Hall argues, the conviction that slavery was never just about the economy, that it permeated the culture and politics of both metropolitan and colonial societies, and that attention to the history of slavery, quote, enriches our understanding of the genealogy of the modern. In this regard, my interest in situating the history of privacy in tandem um, with histories of racialization and enslavement, both in England and in the English colonies, is an extension of, or perhaps a coda to, my research on numeracy, um, value, and kinship. Um, it concerns the process by which an idea comes into being and the impact of the presence of Black people on the formulation of that idea. It also, of course, concerns the impact of that idea on the Black women who come to understand both the politics of their own location, in this case, their exclusion from the category of the private in their own lives, even as their presence in the private lives of white people comes to contradictorily define both white interiority and privacy and the need to act to oppose it. That last point about the private life of whites defined by the presence of black people is, to be honest, um, both the most important claim that I am sidling towards and the least elaborated one in what um, will follow. So please bookmark it and we can return to it during questions. So I'm going to begin with a very rudimentary overview of what it is that I mean when I use the term privacy or private life and how that category is embedded in ideas of kinship and the opposition between kinship and the market. I'll then um, beg your indulgences. And I think this is the last time gonna, that I'm gonna ask you to please forgive me. So um, I'm trying to just power through. Um, I'll beg your indulgences as I consider um, a, a few things from the archives that are informing this new project. Um, and as I do so, there are matters of methodology and narrative that I will highlight. And then I will return to the issue of racialization, uh, the racialization of the public-private divide, um, and to the methodological challenges that it poses for me. Okay, so that's where we're at. Um, this is not the time or the place for a deep dive into the impact of scholarship on the public-private divide for women's and gender history. But briefly, 
we take as a starting point the role of that public-private divide in the creation and expansion of capital. The work of Marx's supposition that in the foundational world, words of Gail Rubin, under capitalism, a worker needs a wife and a wife is a woman who quote, does not inherit, does not lead and does not talk to God, close quote. The emergence in the 19th century of what Nancy Cott defined as women's separate sphere is also foundational and underpins the scholarship on women's history that emerged in the late 1960s and early 19, sorry, the late 1970s and early 1980s to examine how women's organizations challenged the boundaries between public and private spheres. In the context of African-American women's history, those boundaries were deeply troubled by the racist American landscape in which Black women were never afforded the prerogatives of private life, and indeed in which Black families and households were a provocation to white supremacists who routinely and violently shattered Black claims to private life, perhaps in part due to the unexamined degree to which their own claims to privacy, like those to citizenship, have always been subtended by the exclusion of black and brown people from the ideological spaces that their presence actually produces. Feels complicated and circular, but that's what I'm trying to get at. This is perhaps the fundamental contradiction in modern life and one that I can't stop trying to unpick. How do we make sense of foundational categories of freedom and citizenship when those notions were forged in and through the presence of those fundamentally defined as unfree? Further, how do we assess the impact of those people who Nicole Hannah-Jones has most re recently trumpeted as foundational to the idea of freedom, the quote, perfectors of American democracy, close quote. Um, how do we assess the impact of those people on a system whose will to exclude us only extends further and deeper as we move into the 21st century? In any case, from these origins in women's and gender history, um, we are comfortably situated, I think, in an analytic frame in which the rise of capitalism and the production of surplus value is materially connected to the dichotomy posed by the domestic, the home, the private, in relation to the public the space of politics, commerce, and other masculinist pursuits. Um, one in which a dichotomy in which the labor of women and households is redirected towards supporting the production of capital by the male members of that family who traverse the divide into public space, bolstered by a dominant ideology in which women as a class are oppressed. So that's the foundational public-private divide, divide situation. Of course, for Black people, even prior to the expansion of the colonies in the Americas, reproduction and family formation get situated always as part of public life, the public life of the slave owner or of the members of the whitening household in which those early Black Europeans tended to labor. By this, I mean a few things. First, I mean that as Black women, men, and children entered into European and then American slave markets, their identity as members of families became dismantled so as to mark their increasingly racialized enslavability. The reproduction of their status as slaves hinged upon a decided shift in the nature of family formation and a denial of their fundamental and deeply human location in and as kin. Secondly, and simultaneously, the presence of Black people in white households become, became part of the ideological denotation of the household and the family of the patriarch as private space. Particularly in the case of wealthy households across Europe and England, the culture of family would increasingly come to be defined by the presence of those designed to serve it. The notion of a servant as, quote, one of the family became a mainstay of middle and upper class domestic respectability, as at the same time, at the same time that the family life of the domestic worker was fundamentally erased from the consciousness of those whose private life gets defined by such erasures. Erasures, for me, are always provocative, as is the one embedded in the very word family. The etymological roots of the of family is the Latin fam, famulus, famulus, or household slave. It signified then a household in which both blood relations and laborers lived. Family is etymologically rooted in the presence of the slave. Family who were once who are at once intimate and foreign, who would come to be associated with racialized slavery, but who were also quite literally members of that family. So family means this household, the origin of the term means this household, which includes blood kin, but also slaves and or servants. 
Um, as Urvashi Chaudhuri writes, quote, slavery is always philologically and intellectually central to how we must understand generation and nativity, kinship and bloodlines. If the family comes to register the sense of kindred and consanguinity, and even of a race, the slave lies at the heart of the family, indeed is foundational to the family. Etymologically, one quite literally cannot have the family without slavery. So if kinship dismantled by the marketplace both produces hereditary racial slavery as legible to potential enslavers and demarcates their own families as firmly and indeed naturally beyond the reach of the commodifying processes of the market, then this is the um, entry point for my own commitment to thinking more carefully about if and how privacy and the, the notion of the household is rooted in a racialized and gendered 17th century notion of surplus production and the generation of domesticity. Scholars of women and gender in the 17th century have of course raised questions as to whether the notion of a public-private divide is actually a useful construct, given the, the degree to which, um, as Erica Longfellow wrote, the areas of life that we traditionally identify as private or personal, family, religious belief, or sexuality, were actually understood to have economic and communal resonances that made them much more than the business of the individual at that time. Further, um, the early modern marked a period actually of autonomy and political engagement for some English women that then was foreclosed. So there's a sense among, um, among uh, scholars of the early, of early modern women's lives that, that actually there's a kind of um, public nature to women's engagements that, that, that starts to, to close off um, as we move out of the 17th century. It was only then that the notion that private life was associated both with the domestic space of wives and children um, and would be represented presented by the publicly mobile power of the husband and the father, as is written into Locke's Treaties on Government. Um, it's only at the end of the 17th century that that increasingly becomes enshrined in Western legal formulations about the rights to private, privacy or to authority over your subordinates. Um, as Longfellow has argued, a notion of private life as involving both interiority and freedom from the state was something that was only slowly brought to birth um, in the early 17th century. Um, it is here at this moment in time that we see the unfolding of a process in which the category of the private, both as space and as thought, was coming into being. But none of this work is in conversation with the prodigious scholarship on race in early modern English literature and culture, work that argues for careful attention to the symbolic and material presence of Black people in England well before the turn to slave societies that marked the later 17th century English Black Atlantic. Much of the burgeoning field of scholarship influenced by the exceptionally generative work of Ayanna Thompson and Kim Hall and their race before race formulation, Google that if you don't know it, it's race B for race, is concerned with how markers of servitude obtain on the body. Um, but further, as um, Urvashi uh, Chakravarti uh, writes, we must attend to the ways in which the intersection between servitude and kinship animates a reading not just of slavery, but also of race, not as a strange phenomenon, but rather as situated within. Um, this, of course, is in conversation, this, this this demand on the part of scholars that we think about race and slavery um, in the early period, in the 17th century, in the 16th century in England, is something that is in conversation with um, Imtiaz Habib, who noted the frequency with which Africans brought to England in the 16th and 17th century ended up in domestic service. So there's a demographic uh, component to the scholarship as well um, as a sort of intellectual cultural history um, focus to the scholarship that's asking us to to think about what the landscape of racialized or um, yeah, racialized meaning is for both black and white people in early modern England. Um, the presence of black servants or slaves in London households, uh, regardless of their demographic significance, these scholars have argued carried a kind of outsized weight. Um, compelling, among other things, Queen Elizabeth's warrant against Blackamoors, um, which was in part, or which were, warrants 
which were in part based on the spurious ground that black servants were depriving white English citizens of employment as servants, um, a notion that played on a fear of black servants overrunning English households as early as the end of the 16th century, um, crowding out white subjects. In other words, that that's already kind of in the landscape. The presence of black servants then, increasingly ubiquitous, if not entirely common in cities was made manifest in their efforts to leave that service. Simon Newman's examination of runaway slave advertisements in London's 17th century newspapers marks London and Londoners as fundamentally part of the development of transatlantic slavery. The runaway ad, which is seen as a fixture of colonial American newspapers um, and colonial American efforts to, so, to regulate um, slavery and regulate the movement of people originates here in London. Um, and the extent to which those ads produce an image of the absent black servant, who's usually male, um, although occasionally female, as undermining the stability of the London home is part of the question that I am mulling over. So for example, a 20 year old black woman, and I have there, uh, this is a this is a sketch that is made in, in, in London in 1645, around the time that I'm talking about. The 20 year old black woman marked with a brand of her capture on the West African coast, who ran away from the household in which she labored in the late 17th century London, for example, ran dressed as other servants were, but she understood something quite different about her location. She bore the mark of her enslavement on her body, which was branded with the, with the insignia of the ship on which she was originally enslaved um, in more ways than just that brand burned onto her back. So all of this feels for me intimately connected to the ways in which African women both enter and are excluded from the histories and archives of this period. Despite the prodigious work of the race before race and the shake race scholarship and the opening up and redefining of Renaissance studies as a discipline, a survey of the critical work on the notion of the private or of private space in early modern England all unearths almost nothing on slavery or even on whiteness. Um, and then yet, as I think about the ways in which the lives of English women across the spectrum of status and geography, middling, poor, wealthy, urban, rural were defined by their movements in and out of literal marketplaces. So if I think about the women who are the object of study for much of this scholarship on the public private divide and the ways in which they are in and out of markets, buying and selling things that are produced for their home or in their home. Um, I am struck by the substantively different role that marketplaces played for women in the Black Atlantic. And I would like just to think more carefully about the marketplace as a special um, and familiar mark of delineation. Now, I'm very well aware of the scholarship that's, that's um, the, of, of a pretty significant body of work on um, Black market women in American slave societies and in slave societies in the Caribbean, particularly the work of um, Shauna Sweeney, who is working on market women in Jamaica and their role in circulating currency um, as well as goods uh, throughout the Caribbean economy. Um, but this is a phenomenon of the later development of slave societies. And so for the moment, I simply bracket it as something that will come to uphold Black women's claims to private life, like their access to the women who can move in and out of markets, um, can use what what they obtain in those markets as a way to kind of define a domestic space or a, a, a space of interiority. Um, but that's something that, um, that is going to emerge later on. So that's where I'm at. There's a little bit more though. <laughs> in reckoning with slavery, and thank you, by the way, for the ways in which you glossed that work. Um, I contemplate the intersecting material and ideological arenas of value, race, kinship, and refusal in the early modern Atlantic world. I'm trying to think through gender, slavery, and the early modern origins of capitalism through an examination of race and numeracy. numeracy. I do that always with an eye towards finding women who know, women who catch your gaze, and tell you that you were a fool to think that in your efforts to historicize racial categorizations, you know more than she does. I look for her across a range of sources that are literally designed to keep her uh, clarity obscure. In the edicts of royal rulers declaring their lands to be no home to blackamoors, 
I'm just going to run through these pretty quickly. Um, in the work of decorative art that mobilizes those very men and women to outline Europeans um, who were increasingly seeing their status and worth tied to the luminescence of white skin. A skin modified with the application of cosmetics behind closed doors to enhance its whiteness, much to the chagrin of pundits who bemoaned the dependence of whitened and blushed English women's skin on exotic and foreign imports from America, Asia, and Africa, even as the association of whiteness as race and as color became increasingly embedded in Englishness. And I'm interested in the ways that all of these kinds of pieces of evidence come in or like cause me to think about the space of the domestic or the space of privacy. Um, I turn to runaway advertisements on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and of course, I turn to account books and ledgers and inventories and bills of sale where we're really quite um, likely to find reference to these women. There we go. Um, to write a culturally rooted history of early modern race and racialization demands a stance towards the archive, um, a stance that many scholars steeped in critical racial histories of race are well aware of. The works of Hortense Spiller, Saidia Hartman, Catherine McKittrick, Marisa Fuentes, just to start, are the backbone of, backbone of my own engagements thus far and continue to fuel my efforts moving forward. Um, they are scholars who have asked us to think carefully about archival presence and absence and to think about what the production of um, questions that can't be answered by archival evidence help us to see about the deployment of power. So um, in the next little section of the talk, I'm going to um, offer you some other pieces of evidence in the spirit of a conversation about methodology, critical Black history, and historiography, um, as well as obviously historicizing the intersection between race and privacy. So yeah, I'm going to begin quite far away from England. Um, and I know I just said begin, but don't worry, we're like halfway through. <laughs> I know how it is. You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> how much longer are we going to be here? Um, I'll begin quite far away from England or the English Atlantic world. Uh, the first sub-Saharan African person to enter the archives of transatlantic slavery was a woman taken in a Portuguese raid in 1441 at the Rio de Oro in Senegambia. Aside from the fact of her capture, nothing more is known of her or what her captors imagined they had accomplished by seizing her. Still, she represents an origin story of sorts, of the slave trade, of the presence of women as victims of that trade, and of the impossibility of knowing more about her. Her obscurity is, of course, a reflection of how she comes into being for us. She's, re she's rendered into an abstract note of value, a mark on a ledger book, bereft of her context, her language, her gesture, her history, and her kin. She was, of course, something more. She was the beginning of something unspeakable in its wrenching of private life into the market, of indeed defining the notion of the private for some through the gestures that get codified by the slave trade again and again, the gesture of clarifying that we are not them. She is soon joined by others, the first large group of captive Africans, more than 250 who were sold at the southern port of Lagos in Portugal in 1444. Now, in Reckoning with Slavery, I repeatedly return to this episode of the 1453 Chronicles of the Discovery and Conquest of Guinea from the Portuguese chronicle Gomez de Zurada. While the manuscripts circulated only nominally in the 15th century, it wasn't discovered and published widely until the 19th. I find it to be a compelling window onto how Portuguese um, courtiers and sailors and presumably the elite readers who Zorada anticipated to be his audience understood the emerging phenomenon of racial slavery. I believe it speaks directly to the questions that are at the heart of the matter, both for me as a scholar of the early modern Atlantic world and as someone profoundly invested in connecting the reiterative anti-Black violence of today with its origin. So the passage, which I'm about to read out loud, um, exists in a longer text that describes a number of incursions made by the Portuguese along the shores of the area that we now know as Senegambia. I contend that Zerada's description of this first sale of a large group of African captives to European buyers demands um, this repetitious return. It's something I cannot quite turn away from. I keep on going back to it again and again because it is laden with clarity concerning the depth and location of violence and despair that this act inaugurates. Indeed, I would argue it names the abstraction at the heart of its inaugural power. 
So he attempts to, as he says, capture the grief of the 250 African captives. And he writes, though we could not understand the words of their language, the sound of it right well accorded with the measure of their sadness. But to increase their suffering still more, there now arrived those who had charge of the division of the captives and who began to separate one from another in order to make an equal partition. And then was it needful to part fathers from sons, husbands from wives, brothers from brothers. The mothers clasped their other children in their arms and threw themselves flat on the ground with them, receiving blows with little pity for their own flesh, if only they might not be torn from them. He described then or gestured towards the anguish of the division of the captives. The crew severed their bonds of kin in order to group the men, women, and children in equivalent lots to be sold. Lots characterized by abstract prices, not of course by their connections to one another. The sale of these men and women and children happened in the wide open public space of the dock in a bright midday afternoon amidst a gathering of Portuguese consumers, both those buying this new species of property and those who perhaps just aspired to do so. And thus we have the first recorded moment of recognition that motherhood and the marketing of human beings for sale would together prove to be the foundation of the Atlantic world. Or put another way, that kinship and commerce would be inextricable for Africans, even as they were increasingly antithetical for Europeans. Those whose bonds of kinship would not be subjected to dissolution in the marketplace in the way that would characterize the vulnerability of Africans and their descendants. In other words, the, 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 the evidence in front of you that some people are sold in the marketplace while other people would never be sold in the marketplace is becoming, that's part of what's calling blackness into being. It's part of what is, um, is, is sort of spreading uh, as, we, as, as hereditary racial slavery um, spreads. So to return to the text, there are a number of things that feel really significant here. For me, the most important one is the oppositions that are set in motion by the language of commerce versus that of kinfolk. So the, the equal division or the partition of people into equivalent lots versus the language of family, brothers and mothers and fathers and, 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 um, and mothers and children. Um, this is part of, um, I would argue, an enlightenment transformation of knowledge, what Sylvia Winter calls the degodding, in which early modern formulations of commerce and trade subtend the emergent language, not just of race as a corporeal trait, but also the related concepts of racial um, hierarchy that make the trade in human beings rational. And it's this business of rationality, the separation of the rationality of the market from the affective space of the home that's also so um, uh, sort of gnawing at me here. Because by rational, obviously I'm meaning to evoke the collections of presumptions that coalesce around concepts of trade, accounting, currency, and value that increasingly come to define the boundaries between the affective and the calculable, and not at all incidentally those between home and the marketplace. And I think it's that piece, the home and the marketplace, that I feel like I haven't adequately thought through. Thus, Zurara's language of division and equal partitions in opposition to fathers, mothers, sons, and wives conveys more than hereditary enslavement's essential conflict between market and kin. It also marks the essence of what is at the root of the transatlantic slave trade and that which follows in its wake, the simultaneous reliance upon hereditary notions of enslavability with the refusal to accord Africans the prerogative of family. This is something I've written about rather extensively, but its connection to the problem of private life, to the impossibility of privacy or private life for Africans and their descendants feels both urgent and elusive to me. And pardon me for doing this, but I felt like I had to. Um, I asked myself three days ago, is the supermarket a domestic place? Is the wrenching anguish I felt this week looking at the faces of black women and men dead while shopping for a weekend supper or a grandson's birthday cake, an extension of the home invasions that have characterized black life in the wake for generations? 
The foundational intervention of African-American women's history made by scholars like Hazel Carby, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, Darlene Clark Hine, was that African-American women's inability to have and protect private or domestic life from the violence and state policies of white supremacy in fact propelled not just an articulation of black womanhood, but a politics of it. In other words, the, the, the exclusion of black women from the, the sort of protected space of the domestic was at the heart of black women's political organizing um, in, the, in the period they were talking about in the 19th and the 20th century. But also um, to continue to evoke this framework of Christina Sharp's, the work of the wake of simultaneously being in a perpetual state of mourning while also being wide awake to its structural source. For my purposes, the exclusion of black women from the space and the category of domesticity, interiority and privacy, this is what frames my archival work. I am taken aback by what Zorada acknowledges that he could indeed understand the measure of their sadness. He just chose to turn away. So let us jump to the other side of the Atlantic, sidestepping the histories of the development of slave societies, which everyone in this room is familiar with, and return to the runaway ads. Um, the ads offer glimpses of women. So those first ads that I kind of rushed through um, were uh, ads placed in London newspapers for runaway enslaved women. And in Newman's work, it's very, so that the, the ratio of men to women um, in uh, England slave runaway ads is, a, is about, uh, well, not the ratio, the percentage is about 80 to 20. So the numbers of women are, are much smaller who are advertised for. So I don't wanna make a, I, and, and that's, that's also the case um, on the other side of the Atlantic where not in such great dis, uh, uh, they don't, they're, they're not outnumbered to the same extent, but there is clearly a kind of reluctance to uh, advertise for women who run, which I think, um, again, something that people have been thinking through, it has to do with the presumption that women's desire to run away is, is temporary in part because of their connection to households, sometimes the households of the enslaver and sometimes to their own family network. So there's a tension there in terms of how family is being perceived. So in the case of runaways, family is being perceived as, an, as a way to kind of um, engender social control uh, on the part of the slave owner for uh, against um, runaways. But, okay, so the ads offer glimpses of women, I think, who fully understood their location and whose efforts to produce or protect their family life, their privacy, thrust them into the document, uh, the documents that are actively producing imagined publics into the newspapers. A woman who had been captured and had escaped from jail evokes something really quite layered. This is Violet, right? Yes. Um, so runaway in uh, 1762, a mulatto woman slave named Violet, about 35 years of age. She's very active, rather tall. Sometimes afterwards, she was seen in the company of one James Locke, somewhere on the Susquehanna, and by information was apprehended and committed to jail in the year 1764 in Frederickstown, Maryland. Um, on having suspicion of having run away. From that jail, she was reported to have made an escape and two months ago was discovered, two months ago, years later, was discovered about 15 miles from Belfriars Ferry in Fredericks County in Maryland aforesaid where she had three children, um, goes on to ask for her return. For Violet, gone more than seven years, her ties to family, both the man, James Locke, and her three unnamed children have deepened during the years of her migratory moves from Pennsylvania to Maryland. Um, the crisis of death and sale, the catalyst for her escape, the children an anchor for her, and a tantalizing source of wealth for the white man who persists in making his claim to her despite her successes at eluding him. I'm always interested in the intersection between intimacy and violence, between the ownership of children by slave owners and the counterclaims made by women who mothered them. These children embodied um, the contradictory reality of family formation that lies at the heart of the structural logic of slavery, the ways in which women's bodies lay at the fulcrum of hereditary uh, racial slavery, and thus contained a deeply intimate contest over the contours of private life, 
here is a likely mulatto slave named Sarah, but since calls herself Rachel. She took with her her son, a mulatto boy named Bob, about six years old, has a remarkable fair complexion with flaxen hair. Um, she's a lusty wench, about 34 years of age, big with child, so she's pregnant again. She was lightly apprehended in the first Maryland regiment where she pretends to have a husband. Whoever apprehends this woman and boy um, shall receive the above reward. As I read this text, I think that Rachel has determined that she would not bear another remarkable, fair, complex and child with flaxen hair, and instead has chosen a husband who fights in the war, one whose paternity will carry a different remarkable cast. I don't know, of course, I could be wrong, but the call to family, to intimacy and privacy that pressed upon this woman, big with child, a woman who has renamed herself in a gesture of Old Testament acknowledgement that she is fully able to conceive perhaps, is the recognition that her children are not safe at Trenton Ferry and that further south they may very well be so. This is of course a recur, oops, not yet. This is of course a recurring aspect of slavery in the Atlantic world. One that we see reverberating in plantations, urban work sites and households, wherever the demands of labor clashed with ties of kin, the threat of sale, the stealing of oneself. But I wanna read these snatches of women's lives as a kind of a bricolage for a theory of interiority and of politicized knowledge formation. In the passage that I quoted from Zurata's Chronicles, while we see the incursion of the marketplace into the vulnerability of family, we also see in the starkest possible terms, the intensity of African refusals to comply with the marketplace's debilitating impact on their ties to one another. And thus we see the core challenge um, that human cargo posed for Europeans, how to cause the logic of commerce to do away with the affective space of kinship. I think that Cedric Robinson would have called this, this part of the origin of the Black radical tradition, this petty marinage, this um, evidence about the ways in which women and men are trying to push back and thwart um, the efforts of uh, slave, slave ownership and also just of um, racialized hierarchy in general um, to pu push back against its boundaries. This, the, he would, I think that Robinson would call this an effort to claim ontological totality. Um, I have recently called this thing, uh, which I talk about a little more um, fulsomely both in the book and in the Partis article, um, an early modern black woman's political economy. By political economy, I meant to capture black women's critical understanding of the new economy in which they found themselves. But I don't think that the term does justice to what I intended. Instead, I think I need to shift away from a theoretical frame, framework in which the insertion of economic understanding, right, by which I mean the realization that one's reproductive body is firmly cemented to the market and to the market aspirations of a person whose racialized separation from you is in fact produced in the alchemy of those aspirations. That's the economic understanding that I'm after. But I don't wanna suggest that, that because I'm claiming that there's that understanding that that stands in for the legitimacy of their intellectual acumen, right? I, I wanna suggest that, the, that, that I, I think that I need to think more carefully about, about what I mean by economic knowledge in the, on the part of enslaved women um, and, the various ways that I think people come to an understanding of where they are. I've long been concerned that we approach the histories of gender and slavery through a prism that only searches for like the, the feeling aspects of women's lives, like the pain or the triumph, the sort of affective parameters of their life, um, that it is mired in a methodology that directs us away from a reckoning with black people's intellect. I see women's reproductive capacities, their proximity to that foundational destruction that hereditary claims to enslavability wrought as producing more than grief. They produced, if my reading of the archive is correct, evasive strategies in which clarity about newly emerging structures of thought are encoded. One of which was the clearly exclusionary and indeed violently narrow idea of who gets to have domestic space, who gets to have privacy. But the problem of ascertaining this is both evidentiary and conceptual. And it is here that I reach for the scholars who have always helped me to think. As I said at the onset of this talk, it's impossible to approach the history of slavery and gender without confronting the problem of the archive. 
The process by which accounts of court and trade and commerce come to be archived is of course the same one that ends with no accounting at all for the lived experiences of African women and their descendants. As Marisa Fuentes has generatively shown, we must understand that, quote, enslaved women appear through the form and content of archival documents in the manner in which they lived, spectacularly violated, objectified, disposable, hypersexualized, and silenced. The violence is transferred, excuse me, is transferred from the enslaved bodies to the documents that count, condemn, assess, and evoke them. And we receive them in this condition. Fuentes's observations are foundational to me and to many of us. Before we received these women, they were captured by the, by the Atlantic market through a set of ideas and practices that enabled the damage white people did to them and ensured that such damage could only result in archival obscurity. Stefan Palme worried that, quote, the truly stunning wealth of aggregate data on slavery and the slave trade might amount to a mounting heap of abstract knowledge that may well contribute to blocking from view the ghosts of the men and women who are our concern. In an article, a recent article in the New York Times on the slavevoyages.org data set, the journalist Jamil Bowie wrote, quote, it is um, paramount that we keep the truth uh, that we keep the truth of the essential humanity of the enslaved at the forefront of our efforts, lest we recapitulate the objectification of the slave trade itself. By asking questions that are purposely obscured by archival evidence, we are compelled, I think, to think more carefully about how the power that is housed in the archive reverberated in other ideological structures associated with the birth of the modern world. If the archives make it impossible to receive African women as other than historically obscured, damaged and violated, then redressing that damage requires a clear understanding of that which situated them as such. And part of what I'm trying to think through then is the relationship between this kind of categorical insertion of separate space um, as, a, as, a, you know, as a much bigger phenomenon, but also the ways in which the presence of slavery um, helps us to see that. So the women with whom I am concerned were always generating responses to the profoundly new circumstances that were unfolding around them. Those circumstances included uh, their firm displacement outside the category of the private, even as the forces that brought them into archival materiality were propelled by the desire to protect that which is associated with the domestic. So the runaway, the women who run away um, and who do so in and through or to or with family um, are crafting an idea of domesticity, I think, that is uh, at the that is a different, obviously, idea, a different idea of the domestic than the slave owner has. Um, her sense of clarity about the futurity she faced mirrored, I'm arguing, um, a kind of recognition that the terms on which she was being enslaved um, were embedded in, uh, in, in, a, in this kind of mess of economic logic, hereditary racialized enslavability, um, and the refusal of those logics through kinship claims. All of that, I think, lead to questions of how notions of public and private come into being for both the enslaved and the enslaver. Um, I am always trying to understand some of the viscera of what Hortense Spillers laid out so brilliantly when she said that enslaved women were forced to reproduce kinlessness. What does that mean? How does that, how does that, how is that materialized? My supposition builds on the arguments I made around probate records um, in laboring women. There I argued that when crafting a last will and testament, a slave owner who reached into a black woman's reproductive future, assigning her as yet unborn children to his heirs was involved both in some fairly kind of obvious speculative fantasy, but was also delineating his children as unenslavable by mobilizing hers who were infinitely so. This is an act of, of um, this is an act of projecting into the future that's profoundly located in the household, right? And I think that that's something that I'm also, I'm like very, I'm very much aware of the things I haven't been thinking about. <laughs> Um, similarly, the preponderance of the relatively small number of Black women and men in England who served in elite homes, whose status was demarcated in portraiture, became part of the plans that were laid out by aspiring planters and their reluctant wives. So that you can, I feel like there's a connection here between the, the slight, the, the demographically 
um, small, but I think ideologically significant connection between where Black people are kind of situated in early modern Europe and the degree to which men like Richard Ligon or Henry Drax um, lays out these plantation plans that include equal numbers of men and women um, and that include the kind of varying kinds of household needs that they might need, but more so what the planter might need. Um, they suggest a kind of idea about who does and doesn't have domesticity. So those that group of 50 men and 50 women, a um, hundred men and a hundred women who are brought in to work the sugarcane are clearly set outside of the space of the domestic. So let me end with one other um, anecdote from the archive. In 1638 in Boston, in a large household situated on a thousand acres of land on an island in the harbor, um, a couple named Samuel and Amias Maverick, an English couple who had relocated to Boston, enslaved two African women and a single man. Samuel ordered that African man to rape the older of the two African women so as to enrich his family through her pregnancy. A visitor chronicled the aftermath of her rape, saying she, quote, cried loud and shrill, close quote, to him, who, like Zorada, could not understand her language but could understand her grief. A grief no doubt amplified by the intimacy of the household in which she labored and the clarity she must have understood in her bones that, um, uh, that Amias, the mother, the woman, the white woman, um, and her daughters were not just protected in their domestic space, but that the African woman, who's not named, of course, um, that her rape for the express purpose of breeding more slaves for the Mavericks was in fact part of what defined the private life of the Maverick family. Does it matter to this unnamed woman that the year she was raped in Boston was the very same year that King Charles the First Council at Westminster declared that, quote, England was too pure an air for slaves to breathe in? No, not at all. Does it matter to us? The simultaneity of denial and evidence of slavery saturation into even the most intimate space of both English and Black life the eruption into domestic quarters of the most public aspiration for racial dominance, I think it should. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was a, a brilliant lecture Thank that you. highlighted so much of the, the richness of reckoning with slavery, but also show how, shows how you're using a lot of that Thank to you. think through these points and go further. That was really good. We have time for some questions. We have um, two microphones, Mats and Naya have microphones. If you indicate by hand uh, who you are in your question, I'll call on you and a microphone will be brought to you. Hi, Hi. Um, first off, I'm mega fan girl of ESA. I'm so excited that you were able you. to come, especially because like you live in the States and I was like, I'm not gonna be able to see you. <laughs> so it's very exciting, um, but um, I'm particularly interested in the idea uh, or in the construction of the archive. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that uh, feminist historiography and um, historiography on black women and um, enslavement is really um, important for is um, like one thing that I think about a lot is about this idea that history should be obje objective mm -hmm. and then what that means for the archive and then I was, so I was wondering how you consider the importance or the place of subjectivity mm -hmm. from a, as a historian like your own personal subjectivity mm -hmm. and how that uh, influences mm -hmm. how you see the archive and mm -hmm. the silences yeah. within the archive. So I think you know it's it's interesting to me that at this moment um, meaning like the 2010s and the start of the 2020s, there's so much explicit conversation about archive problems and the, 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 the and, and I think it's, I mean, on the, on the one hand, this is not, this is not new, right? We know that the archive is always a place that you kind of 
you have to battle a little bit in order to find what you're looking for. But certainly scholars who have always written on the subaltern, on, uh, on, on people who don't leave the kind of evidence that states leave, have always kind of understood their relationship to the archive to be different than those people who are writing political histories, for example, or the histories of people who document their own lives. So on the one hand, I don't want to, you know, it's important that we know that this is, this is a, it's, it's just a thing, right? On the other hand, it is, um, it is enormously significant, I think, for, uh, for the field of critical race studies. I'm hesitant to use that phrase these days in my country. We're not allowed to say those words. Um, and I don't know, and I don't, I mean, I mean the schol scholarship on Black life right, on the deep history of Black life. Um, it is really important that we are clear about what the archive leaves out, because part of what the archive leaves out is, the, or the evidence of what the archive leaves out is the evidence of how power is accumulated in order to continue a problem of subjugation, of, um, you know, historical erasure, et cetera, right? So, so I don't want to, I don't want to claim, I think that it is not insignificant that this kind of the sort of theoretical work that I'm, um, that I'm, uh, that I talk about more, you know, elaborately in the book and elsewhere um, is coming out of people who are often, though not only people of color, scholars of color who are also occupying interdisciplinary spaces. And I think that our interdisciplinarity is also a response to our inability to answer the questions that we have through a single um, methodological relationship to sources. I'm sorry, I feel like I hear myself uh, you're okay. Uh, like back thinking in the so so I think that that's I think that those things are both true, right? That there's a particularly kind of urgent and I think beautifully articulated critique of race and the archive that is coming out of a group of scholars who I think are often unfortunately labeled Afro pessimists because I don't think that that's an adequate uh, way to characterize the work, um, but. I think it's not insignificant that that's happening. And I think that it's not insignificant that they are black people, black scholars, um, and that their engagements with their scholarship, often not always, but often come from a kind of critical interdisciplinarity. Thank you for that question. Thank you so much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. On. Yep, it's on. Um, so I, I'm just, I'm stuck on the sort of creation of enslaved people as private property at the same time that their private life is disrupted. But I'm also interested in where the body is situated in this project. Mm -hmm. And so, so much of the runaway slave ads oftentimes make public private details of yep. enslaved people's bodies yep. and even the sexual violation. So I know that you're focused on sort of the intellectual history and the history of kinship, but I'm wondering if there's a way that you can bridge mm -hmm. the history of the body mm -hmm. and what the place of the history of the body is within mm -hmm. this particular work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that question. I think that that's exactly, so I, I think that that's a, that's a very, um, a good example of this larger problem that I'm that I'm trying to kind of name, which is the designation of um, of certain people as being publicly traded, publicly scrutinized, and 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 I think that that you know I'm I'm thinking about the work of Stephanie Camp and others, um, Thavoli Glimp. Uh, Tara Hunter, who talked about, uh, who've used kind of the history of the body and the history of Black women in particular's um, kind of efforts to reclaim the body is at the core of their intervention. So I, I think that that's an important part of this. I'm also thinking about, um, sorry, you just said something that, oh, it was so brilliant in my head and now I can't. Um, I think there's also a Mm, I'm going to have to come back to it. It was right there. It was right there. Um, making public private details of the body. Adverts. Ugh. If someone asked me another question, I'm going to circle back to that. Come back. <laughs> Hi. I'm not sure if this is relevant. But I am also a Guyanese. I had to leave school at 14 
it was primary school in our days. Then you had junior Cambridge, senior Cambridge matriculation. My schooling finished at 14, but my education continues until today mm -hmm. because I'm learning a few things now that I wasn't aware of before. Mm -hmm. But we have to be very careful with language, mm -hmm. especially the English language. Mm -hmm. You know, and a few words came up. Research. Mm -hmm. People use the word research in a way as though it's their research, mm -hmm. which is, it is not. Any word that begins with a RE is French and it means to go over. Mm -hmm. So when somebody said they did their research, they are lying to themselves. But we continue to do this all the time. We, then it became stand, it becomes standard. It's like birthday. Mm -hmm. How could it be your 50th birthday? It's not your 50th birthday, it's your birth date. Mm. But we buy into it. And as Eve, going back to what you were speaking about, our uh, history, mm -hmm. we ourselves buy into the narrative that is being perpetrated without understanding what it's doing to us. Mm -hmm. You know, the Stockholm syndrome is a case in point. I would say to people, read Billy Lynch letter, The Making of a Slave, mm -hmm. and think about what it is saying and what the effect of it is today. Mm -hmm. Because until we do that, a lot of what is being said is nonsense because it, these perpetrators are the same ones who are advocating a lot of what is happening. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of changes, but it remains the same. Mm -hmm. It sounds a bit ridiculous. I would say I, I was in this country from the sixth, 1960. There has been a lot of changes but things remain the same. Why is it? Those are the questions we have to answer. There are a lot of words going around, mm -hmm. around the same situation, but it means nothing. Mm -hmm. Those who make the rules has control. You go for a job, the rules are already there. Mm -hmm. Who made it? Thank you, you have to abide with it. I appreciate, I really appreciate your point. And I would say two things that I hope, I love what you just said about research. Um, I, I, I said quickly here, but that I'm, I'm always grateful and I always try to acknowledge the shoulders of the people who I'm standing on um, and particularly the other scholars who I think with Right, and I and I think that that to me is is my own effort to say like this is a set of conversations I owe an enormous debt to people who have opened my brain up to thinking about things in a new way. And then that gets to the last thing that you said, which is that um, the more things change, the more they stay the same. I think there are times when I think you're right, and the times right right now when I'm gesturing to the really kind of appalling state of racial violence that is saturating my country and yours as well. Um, on the other hand, I think that understanding something about the, about the way in which ideas get formed around race and around places that we think are not about race, but which I think are, is part of the work of trying to undo that, that sort of cycle of recurring where the same people are always on top and the same people are always on the bottom. So I appreciate the question. Thank you.
Um, first of all, thank you so much, Professor Morgan, for the insightful talk. Um, you mentioned about how some of the archives would, you, all, you want to ask questions which is purposefully obscured by the archives. Yeah. So just kind of wondering um, in future research, how would you plan on strategizing leveraging on other resources to, to answer those questions if the archive fails to do that? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's part, so um, I, I, what I intend to do is to spend a little bit more time on the, the stuff that I gestured to, right? So like the, the demographic presence of black people in Europe um, is, is very interesting to me, both in the relationship between how many black people are in Europe um, in the 1500s, 1600s, um, and then how that presence shapes the kind of willingness of European settlers to engage in forced labor, right, to, to mobilize it. And so to me, that's one of the questions that I'm asking about this business of who's got, who's got home and who doesn't. Um, and for me, I have to ask that across a range of sources. So I'll just, I'll just do the thing I always do, which is just start reading widely and thinking about, you know, what does it mean to take seriously the work of scholars who've unearthed all the ways in which a kind of racialized set of conversations are going on in, for example, you know, Shakespearean drama and literature and sonnets and thinking obviously about the work of Kim Hall and Ayanna Thompson here, but, but putting that into conversation with the demographics and the, and the kind of data that we have about the slave trade, where people are coming from, where they're going, and then to ask, to sort of re-ask these questions that I have. I don't always feel confident that I'm going to end up with a really clear answer, but I feel like posing the question is part of what I said, like that unpicking of the of knowledge, like at what point um, does privacy, this is, I'm obviously interested in a moment that's well before kind of legal rights to privacy and the ways in which those rights are being completely dismantled in my country right now um, by other people mobilizing other ideas of privacy. I, it's, I, I'm just, I'm all, so yes, that was very inarticulate. But what I'm saying is that I think that by understanding how ideas cohere in an earlier moment, I can understand how they are deployed um, in our current moment. Um, so this project here, as I was saying to my friends over lunch, is an, is an article. I think it's not a book on privacy. I think it's an article. Um, and I think I would like to, uh, figure out what comes next. <laughs> Perhaps given time, maybe let's take a round of mm -hmm. three and then have um, Dr. Professor Morgan respond. Thank you. Th thank you very much for such an enlightening um, presentation. Um, I, I just, we, we are kind of presenting it in, in, in this part of the world. Uh, what are the, is, there's the reverse where the actual um, slavery took place is all where it starts. And knowing that there were also settlers there and, and that, that was that mirror of what happened um, in here happened equally as in Southern Africa, South Africa, Zimbabwe, you know, all these things. And, and how do we also from here, how do you connect those, not just leave them in here? How do you go back to, to where the, and things take place, people also to engage. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Emily? I think it's behind you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll keep it brief. Um, I was really interested in, um, you're talking about sort of treating these uh, women who ran away as intellectual beings who made a strategic decision in order to create a private life for themselves. So I was just wondering um, what, what could, how would that odds look to them? I mean, mm -hmm. how effective were these newspaper ads in, in, in locating them? And yeah. to what extent could a woman sort of foresee what her private mm -hmm. life would be if mm -hmm. she ran away? That's such a good question. So it, there's, there, it's very hard to correlate the, the placing of an ad with the retaking of it. So you have to do a lot of cross work of like looking at inventories to see when people are not inventoried and then are re-inventoried. And so there are people who've done a lot of work to talk about that also to explain 
the degree of running away that doesn't see find its way into newspapers. I think that rather than thinking about those women and like the likelihood of their recapture, right? I'm more interested in the in framing the decision making process to leave as one that is, of course, affective, right? It's about emotion, but it's also strategic. It's also, it takes advantage of particular moments. It's clearly like the woman who is away for seven years, she's not like hiding in the woods, right? She's living someplace and there are people who are, you know, supporting her clandestine, you know, life or not, you know, or it doesn't need to be clandestine, right? So I think it's more interesting. I think that the ways in which women have been discussed in runaway slave advertisements as they've been discussed in maroon, you know, larger uh, marinage. This is always about affect. It's always about either um, uh, explaining why they do run or they don't run based on, you know, feeling and fear and all of that. And I just want to interject this other space. Um, and I know there was a so one other question. Yeah. What can we do with them? I'll Two. squeeze in one more, but very briefly, thanks. This gentleman and this gentleman. It's going to be, it's going to be very brief. Um, first of all, uh, Professor Morgan, thank you for a wonderful discourse. Um, the historian Trevor Bernard, um, through the diaries of Thomas Thistlewood, is able to uncover a lot of the things, yeah. um, the private lives of women and how their power was taken from them. And um, it's pretty informative from a Caribbean perspective. Um, I'd just like to know a little bit more about how you went about your work in order to uncover probably what happened in the Americas and so on and so forth. Sure. Since such um, atrocity are levied against blacks, what's your view on white people teaching black history mm. since it comes with such high emotions. <clears throat> okay. So, um, I think that there's a there's a, a deep reservoir of, um, of of historical work on what makes Atlantic slavery different from slavery in the continent or servitude elsewhere, right? Like there's a, we understand that there's a distinction between, um, between hereditary racial slavery in the Atlantic world and slavery in other times and places. But I think that we haven't yet done quite the work to unpack this, this the alleged dichotomy between um, enslavement and servitude. Right, and that's part of what the race before race scholars are doing. It's thinking about the the idea of the servant in England and in the colonial uh, British co English colonies. Um, the sort of moment when there's both people who are um, in a in unfree forms of labor who are English as well as African, as well as indigenous and trying to parse out what those different experiences are and what the words mean both legally and experientially. So I think that's still a, a process that is, that is unfolding. The Thistlewood Diaries are such a, it's, they're just like such a profound smoking gun. Um, it's just astonishing what's in the Thistlewood Diaries. And I think that Bernard's work on those diaries is a first step, but there's so much more to be done on the lives of those women who um, done from the perspective of those women rather than the perspective of Thistlewood. So I, I know that there are other people working on those diaries right now. Um, these are diaries of a slave owner who, um, who, who uh, keeps track of all of the times he rapes women um, and where he rapes women and how often he rapes women. Um, and so it's this, you know, he's a he's a, a an, an overseer on a Jamaican plantation. So there's there's that. Um, but I think there's still a lot more to be done. I don't have that kind of evidence. <laughs> But I do have these moments in the archive that are moments of, that kind of let you understand something about what's going on on early slave ships, let you understand something about the presumption that sexual access is part of what slave ownership gives 
uh, slave owners, that they have that prerogative. Um, and you see these little moments in the archive, which you then I, I sort of weave together to make an argument about the sort of inextricability of sexual violence reproductive capacity, the idea of race and what enslavement means for African women and men in the Americas. Um, but it's, a, it's not as, you know, the thistlewood is a, that's a big find. Um, I think that everybody who's interested in history needs to tell the history of Black people and white people and Indigenous people. I think that all of us need to grapple with the, the weight of our histories and to say that only one person, one kind of a person should be teaching a, a certain kind of history feels to me to be, sh to be like short-sighted. Um, and what I want to see is, I, I, you know, is, is a, a professional space. And I understand, also I'm talking about the, an American academic uh, space in which there is support for and uh, and mentoring for all sorts of underrepresented faculty. Because I think when in answer to this other question about the archive, part of what I'm saying is that it's in part black scholars who are creating this new wave of scholarship that's helping everybody rethink power, race, sexuality, et cetera. Um, so I want there to be structures in place that there are more and more people of color, first generation scholars, et cetera, in academic spaces because, because of the perspective that that, that then infuses um, by the same time token, I think that, again, everybody who teaches has to, has to think about and be attentive to and careful about the ways in which their own location um, might contribute to damage in ways that you, you know, that you might be unaware of if you're not thoughtful. So, um, but I wouldn't say that white people shouldn't teach the history of race and slavery. In fact, I, I would say that you know, all people need to be teaching, all teachers, <laughs> not all people, all teachers need to be teaching this work because it's, it's only through a kind of collective um, project that we're going to be able to understand the damage and the ways out, the ways forward. So. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I just have to move. That's a brilliant way to end uh, this evening's lecture. And I just move now to offer a vote of thanks quite briefly. Our first vote of thanks, of course, is to Professor Morgan for sharing her work with us and for stimulating a lot of ideas for all of us that I'm sure will take away with us. So thanks again, uh, Professor Morgan. Uh, I also want to thank the team that made this evening possible. Uh, our student volunteers, uh, our team of uh, intrepid uh, volunteers who worked with us as ushers and also in the planning, uh, Nayo Keke, who's here, who I also mentioned earlier in your absence for the work you, you did on uh, helping us find research on Elsa Govaya's uh, student life. Thank you, Nayo. Hannah Beckers, Isaac Critchlow, Zach Myers in the back. And uh, thanks to Professor Catherine Hall for her introduction of Professor Morgan uh, this evening. And a very special thanks to uh, Matt Stallard, my comrade in arms at the center for a lot of the uh, heavy lifting and planning for this evening's event. Uh, and finally, but definitely by no means least, thanks to all of you for coming out and sharing time with us and uh, energy and spirit with us. Uh, please have a good evening and we look forward to seeing you again at our next event. Thank you. Thank you.